This is the story of Joseph Forgas, why he tried to escape from communist Hungary and what happened next. He was born in 1947 in a country that was going through extraordinary times. Two years before he was born, the Soviet army had liberated Hungary from German occupation near the end of the Second World War. But the Soviet army hadn't left. In free elections later that year, the Independent Smallholders Party had received 57% of the vote, but the Soviet occupiers insisted that it should govern in a coalition which included the Communist Party, even though the Communists had received only 17% of the vote. Gradually the Communists arrested and forced into exile their political opponents and established one-party rule in 1949. In 1956, when Joseph was nine years old, there was a successful revolt against this Russian-dominated communist government. But then the Soviet army arrived in force again. It crushed the revolt and reimposed communist rule. When Joseph grew up to be a young adult, he decided he wanted to leave his home country. What made him feel this way? What was it like living under communist rule? How did he try to escape? And what happened next? First, why did he want to leave? There were multiple reasons. Uh, the most immediate reason was the occupation of Czechoslovakia. Everybody in Hungary, as far as I know, looked at what's happening in Prague and the regime of Duk Dubček, Alexander Dubček, as a kind of a hope. Most people uh, in Hungary were did not conceive that Hungary could ever become a capitalist liberal democracy because the Russian troops were everywhere. Hungary was an occupied country. But what people were hoping for is that maybe this system can transform itself into a more acceptable, more humane uh, kind of social democracy. And that experiment in Prague, when it was uh, suppressed by the military occupation of the country by the Russians and the Warsaw Pact, that was literally a shattering experience for everybody. At that point it seemed inevitable that this system, this regime cannot be rescued, it cannot change, it will always be the same. And I was there at the age of 22 and I thought I do not want to live the rest of my life under those circumstances. What were the conditions of life like in Hungary in 1969? What were the sort of circumstances that Joseph found difficult to accept? Just to give you an example, uh, if you wanted to apply for a passport in Hungary in the 1960s, you had to get seven or eight signatures of people to testify that you are a reliable person. First you had to get the concierge in the apartment building where you live to sign. Then you had to go to the block representative to sign. Then you had to get the trade union boss in wherever you worked to sign, who was of course part of the party organization. You had to have the party secretary to sign. You had to have your immediate boss to sign. And you had to have the head of the company to sign. Any one of those people could simply have denied the signature and that would be the end of it. There is no appeal, there's nobody you can go to. Your rights as an individual are literally non-existent. So the situation was really that mentally you learned that there is nowhere to turn. It's a complete absence of pluralism. What makes Western society free and what makes Western liberalism work is that there are multiple channels of power and multiple channels of influence. If you get in trouble with your boss, you can go and complain uh, to his boss or you can go to the newspapers or you can go to a solicitor or you can organize a protest on the street. There is many, many ways in which you can try to seek justice. In a society, in a communist society, none of this is possible. And it's worse than that because anonymous people who dislike you for whatever reason, your neighbor who doesn't like your cat, could write an anonymous report to the secret police saying that he overheard you listening to Radio Free Europe or the Voice of America. And that would be enough for you uh, to never be allowed to travel, possibly not allowed to study, uh, and various other sanctions to be used against you and you would never know why. Anybody who in any way 
uh, wanted to do you harm could do so. And there was never any redress. If they refused your passport application, they didn't give any reasons. They just said, currently it's not in the interest of our socialist country for you to travel. End of story. Even if you were in a public place, you went to a restaurant, for example, with your family. The moment anybody started to say anything that had some political overtones, somebody would say, shh, you don't know who is sitting next table, be careful. And that's how it worked. You didn't know who was sitting at the next table. If the person at the next table was, you know, part of the secret service, they could come over to you and take you away. So that kind of fear of what you can do and what you can say was always present. So finally, Joseph decided that he would leave. He had thought of escaping previously, but had stayed because he was in love with his girlfriend, Magda. But things changed, and by 1969 he was free to go. It was a major decision, though, fraught with danger to himself and his family. You couldn't leave a communist country legally. You were not allowed. It was a very serious criminal offence to attempt to cross the border without permission. My particular uh, situation was that I was working in a hotel and uh, there was a three-day public holiday on the 20th of August and during those three days I didn't have to work. And I had a permission to travel to Yugoslavia. I couldn't travel of course to Western Europe but Yugoslavia was a little bit more liberal than Hungary. And so I had this job of uh, finding my way from Yugoslavia to either Italy or Austria in the three days that I had at my disposal. So basically I went to the railway station and I took the night train to the edge of Yugoslavia next to Italy. And my plan was to swim across that bay of Trieste, it's a three kilometer waterway and actually quite a few people have done it before so it was feasible to do. It was literally on the shore at dusk I remember standing there uh, you know there was a kind of rocky shore and I was looking across to the to Trieste and the three kilometer distance and I had I even had my few possessions packed in a plastic bag with the idea that I had carried it on my head while I swim but then I actually faced the, the, the last minute I have to go into that water and swim across, I couldn't do it. Uh, then my next idea was, okay, if I didn't swim and if I can't get papers, maybe I have to go through the land border to Austria. So then I hitchhiked to Maribor and then about 2 a.m. Uh, I took my little backpack and started walking across the forest. Uh, within 10 minutes they caught me. I was in the middle of this dark forest, I thought I'm doing okay and suddenly there were reflectors shining at me and Yugoslav border guards with Kalashnikovs pointed at me and shouting, stoy, stoy. So I froze, uh, they arrested me and they took me to the police prison in Maribor, uh, that was the local prison. And that was a very nerve-wracking experience because if they take you back to Hungary, you go to jail for five to ten years and all hope for the rest of your life is gone. You can never study, you can never travel, you will never be able to get a better job, you will not be promoted. This, uh, the consequences of having to try to flee would stay with you for the rest of your life. So it was a, a very high stakes uh, situation. 24 hours later, after I've been in jail, they took me to a police magistrate who basically told me that I committed an offence by trying to cross the Yugoslavian border without permission and I have two options. They will either have to uh, return me to Hungary where I will be charged or I have to pay a fine. And the fine was, I remember, clearly $20. And I actually had some money with me because working in a hotel I could change uh, currency and so I had a little bit of money. I paid the fine and they released me. And then I had one more day left to make my escape, otherwise I have to go back to Hungary. So the next day I went back to Zagreb once again by uh, hitchhiking and checked into the youth hostel in Zagreb and met an American student there 
uh, and we started talking. And we went to see a film together in Zagreb. The, I think it was the Dirty Dozen. Had a beer, and eventually I was by that time so stressed that I told him uh, my predicament that I had. I, you know, I need to get across the border, and I ran out of options. I don't don't know what to do. And this American student told me. Well, I'm heading to Salzburg tomorrow, I have to fly home to the US and if we rent a car, I would be willing to take you across the border. Uh, then we picked up two Californian hippies in the youth hostel who were also trying to go to Austria and we drove back to Maribor. And a kilometer before the border, I jumped into the boot, they put all their luggages and, and rugs on top of me and they, they proceeded to drive across the border. And that was one of probably the most difficult 15 minutes I spent because the border, in the, in the boot there was no air, I was practically suffocating, and I was sitting right above the exhaust and I was burning, so I was really, really uncomfortable. And I thought I won't be able to last, so I got uh, hammered at them and said, you know, stop, I'm not going to survive, let me out. And they said, hang on, one more minute, we're almost there. I still get emotional when I think about this. And indeed, a couple of minutes later, we were across the border. Uh, they opened the boot, I got out, and I was in Austria. I made it. This was a triumphant and emotional moment. But what happens to a refugee after he or she finally gets to safety? First, some practical things. The next day I reported to the Austrian police. I said I'm a uh, refugee, political refugee from Hungary. The Austrian police gave me temporary papers and they basically said, well, it's up to you to find a place where you can settle. Uh, a refugee situation, being a political refugee, does not give you settlement rights. It gives you temporary protection. And I always had a plan to go to Australia, so the same day I went to the Australian uh, embassy in Vienna, which had an immigration office at the time, and I registered as a potential assisted migrant with the Australian government. I had to wait in Vienna for three months until my papers came through. Apart from the practical issues, Joseph had to face the momentousness of what he had done. You knew that if you left Hungary illegally, you won't be able to return, possibly ever. You didn't know. It means you may not be able to see your parents. You may not be see, able to see any of your friends or high school friends. You may not be see, able to see your girlfriends, even if you no longer go out with them. So it's almost like an entire life and everything it means. The settings, the people, the, the language, the culture, the, the sights, everything is cut, finished. You may never be able to go back. And that's a very, very stressful situation. I think most migrants who came from behind the Iron Curtain went through that. You had to cut off everything. Uh, at the, when you're young, you kind of think, no, no problem, I'll find a home somewhere else. But it's not as easy as all that. So it was costly that way. The, the other issue was facing uncertainty. You know, you made across the border, fantastic, what next? Where do you go? What will happen to you? What will you do? Uh, will I stay in Austria? Will, I, will they accept me in Australia? If they would not have accepted me in Australia, where do I go? You know, you have this total uncertainty. Normally when you are born into a country and you grow up, you have a trajectory. You can see your life taking a particular direction by the time you're 22. If you do what I've done, this is over. Everything is up for grabs. You don't know what will happen. So you are scared. It's scary. And those three months when I was in Vienna, uh, after having left Hungary but not yet having gone to Sydney, were the most difficult three months of my life, psychologically. Because you, you live a life, you get up in the morning, but you just don't know what you should be doing. What should you prepare for? You know, you're in limbo. Joseph was eventually given permission to emigrate to Australia, which at that time was actively encouraging more people to come. He was pleased with his choice of country, but became dismayed by what many people there and elsewhere in the West imagined life to be like under communist rule. 
A lot of people I spoke to had absolutely no understanding of the nature of the communist system, which at that time was of course still in existence. They had very idealized notions of a more egalitarian, a more utopistic society, which despite its difficulties is heading the right direction. I had countless arguments and debates and discussions with people trying to explain to them that they have a fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of communism and how it really works. But I'm not really confident that I managed to convince anybody. It was a very, very difficult uh, idea to put across. And most people who grew up in Western liberal democracies actually can't even imagine what it is really like to live in a totalitarian society. I think the idea that as an individual you completely insignificant, powerless and exposed is very difficult for somebody to understand who never had that feeling. The other issue that's very difficult to explain to people is the monolithic totalitarian nature of communism. Even right-wing fascist dictatorships do not directly run every aspect of life. Even in Hitler's Germany, there were businesses which were not state-owned, there were churches which were not totally state-controlled. The really difficult aspect of communism is that there is one single source of centralized power, and this source of power encompasses everything. It's, uh, everything is nationalized, every company, every workplace is run by the party, uh, everything is run by the party. There's actually no escaping it. Joseph Forgas pursued an academic career in Australia. He is now the Scientia Professor of Social Psychology at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. The communist regime in Hungary fell in 1989 and became a member of the European Union in 2004. Joseph is now able to go back and visit his native country and some of the people he once left behind.